Does India need a law on match fixing? Should match fixing be recognized as a criminal offense in India? The answer to that is yes. And according to latest reports which are coming in and which are pretty alarming, that of the uh, international fixers, eight are supposed to be Indian. The name of Ravinder Dandiwal has come up as one of the ace fixers, not only in cricket internationally, but he's been apparently allegedly targeting other sports in different countries like tennis and uh, uh, such like, where he's apparently targeting young players who are susceptible, vulnerable, and uh, a lot of reports are coming in about Ravinder Dandiwal. So it raises an issue as to what should be done to stop this malaise, what can be done. I'll give you some interesting points to think over. The first uh, comes from, uh, there is a strong belief which comes from Steve Richardson, the coordinator of investigations at the ICC's anti-corruption unit. And uh, then Ajit Singh, who is the head of the BCCI's ACU, and they both concur with the viewpoint that India needs a very strong law to stop this malaise and it currently doesn't have one. And that is the source of corruption of cricket in India. Now, India is scheduled to host two very big events and uh, uh, that would give an opportunity, these gentlemen believe, and others too, uh, for match fixing in India, for uh, corruptors in the game to target. And those two events over the next three years uh, in India are the 2021 T20 World Cup, followed by the ODI World Cup in 2023. And uh, that gives a window for India to act upon, and uh, I believe it should. Now here, Sri Lanka has taken a march over everyone else in South Asia, because in 2019, it uh, criminalized match fixing with punishments leading up to 10 years of jail sentence, which is a pretty strong punitive measure. In this quest, the ICC ACU, which is the anti-corruption unit, had helped the Sri Lankan government to draft proper legislation. So if the Indian government wants any help from the ICCU, obviously is going to get it. And uh, Richardson said, we'll do everything we can to disrupt the corruptors, and we do. We make life very difficult for them, and as far as much as we can to stop them from operating freely. But, and the big question is that, Police action alone is not going to be sufficient unless and until this is recognized as a criminal offense. He says, we have currently just under 50 investigations. The majority of those have links back to corruptors in India. So it would be the single most effective thing to happen in terms of protecting sport if India introduces such match-fixing legislation that one is talking about. Richardson goes on to say, that I could actually deliver to the Indian police or the Indian government now at least eight names of people, eight names of people who are what I would term serial offenders. So the ICC has those eight names who are known as serial offenders. All are Indian. At the moment, with the lack of legislative framework in India, it is, and this is his quote, it is very limited with what the police can do. And uh, much as we try professionally, without proper legislation, this is not going to work. There is... In this entire thing, it is the most important point to remember, and India has experienced uh, a lot of such instances ever since the time of Hansi Cronier when he, when he came down here with his team from South Africa to play, and we all know what happened. Uh, there are other key names uh, which came up, uh, that of Mohammad Azaruddin, Ajay Jadeja, but they were subsequently cleared. But there has been a cloud uh, surrounding the sport ever since then, then with IPL coming in, we all know uh, constantly certain names pop up. There is suspicion. The name of Sri Sant came up. He was, of course, cleared subsequently. But these are issues that need to be cleared and clarified. For example, investigators believe that more than the players, it is corruptors outside cricket who are to blame, who are the main people that one should look out for. Not so much the players. Of course, players are to be blamed, but it's the corruptors. Uh, that, that need uh, to be taken care of. If you remember in England, uh, back in time, in the Pakistan team, Mohammad Amir Salman Butt, Mohammad Asif, they were prosecuted under the 1906 Prevention of Corruption Act. And uh, they faced very strong punitive measures at that point in time. Probably it more or less ended the career of Mohammad Asif, who was a brilliant bowler. Mohammad Amir was a very young man. Salman Butt was the captain. It also took away five to six years of Mohammad Amir's life possibly, probably he lost the best five years 
and uh, the game of cricket also lost uh, pro a great bowler, seeing a great bowler emerge. The ICC is uh, of the point of view that do, they do not see the main problem as coming in from the players alone. They see that players are the final link in the chain who actually would go out onto the pitch and perform any act if they have agreed to do so. The problem they feel is, the, is in the upstream where the money actually comes from and which corrupts the system. In 2013, the Indian government reacted and uh, there was a, a draft bill was presented for the prevention of sporting fraud, but it has not been acted on subsequently. So uh, there has been no headway. If you remember in 2016, the LODA committee came in, which drew a lot of reforms and tried to clean up, uh, clean up the system. It drew the framework that paved for the structural reform of the BCCI. It told the Supreme Court, and listen to this carefully, it told the Supreme Court that the Law Commission of India should look into criminalizing match fixing in sport and that hasn't happened till now. LCI also recommended to the Indian government that it considers regulating betting and gambling activities as against imposing complete prohibition. So who are the people who are susceptible? So it could be a player, it could be a curator, it could be a match official, it could be just about anyone who is within the system. And the amount of money involved is unimaginable. So it's very easy to sit outside and pontificate that why do players throw matches? Why uh, is so-and-so official being booked for corruption? What is the uh, need for so much uh, susceptibility? Um, aren't they paid well enough? But I'll give you some numbers and it's going to shock you. Unverified accounts, according uh, to ICC and BCCI, uh, and the sources are basically from Ajit Singh, who heads that unit. The annual turnover from betting in India is in the range of 30 to 40,000 crores. I'll repeat that figure. It's 30 to 40,000 crores. It's huge. It's unimaginable. And these come even at the domestic cricket level where there are certain godfathers who help promote certain players. And if you remember that cricket in India is played a lot in these rural belts in Mufasal towns and you have a local bigwig, a local, it could be anybody uh, who comes in as a benefactor, as a godfather, who finances a certain player with potential. That player rises up to a particular level where that match in which he's playing is, is televised. That is the point when the godfather wants certain returns. That is where the corruption is injected into the system. The player who is probably from a, a poor background, impoverished background, or for any other reason feels that he owes it to that godfather in his difficult days. So what does he do? That player becomes susceptible. That is the point that this uh, system needs to be cleaned up and everyone is worried about it. State leagues are another source where uh, corruption is allegedly very prevalent and it's not just the IPL and uh, figures that are being uh, spoken about by Mr. Richardson and by Mr. Ajit Singh is it could go up to like 20 million euros or pounds. Those are again massive figures. There is another type of, of a player who is susceptible. That player is either who is close to retirement, who hasn't done too well in, uh, in his career, or someone who does not see much of a future for, for themselves. So both categories are susceptible. It could be somebody very young. It could be somebody who is on the wane or a middling guy who has been in and out, but hasn't done too well, knows that there is no future. In any case, it's a very truncated uh, career. It's a short life. So if you can't make the bucks, then when are you going to do it is the question they ask themselves. I'll also bring up another point, which is while betting is illegal in India and uh, it is governed by a law, uh, which is the 1867 Public Gambling Act, where fines are between 200 to 500 rupees. Now, that's absolutely laughable. It makes zero sense, but that is how it should be. But that is how it is. And betting and corruption, again, are two words. Betting and corruption, they are two words which are different. They are separate because while betting is uh, legal in certain countries, obviously corruption is not. Where the outcome is concerned, I believe that there are two things which uh, need to be done. One is we should have a specialized investigative agency with all the right powers and uh, which should be able to carry out a thorough investigation assisted by uh, the other parts of the system. 
and it should be backed by law with some very severe punitive fines unless there is fear of fines, unless there is fear of losing everything, unless uh, you uh, basically take uh, certain corrupt entities, not only take their money away but attach their properties, put them in jail, do your best to set them up as examples. This is not going to go away.